learn that you're not a Christian, that you're not a child of the living God. And that's what happens when we are influenced by evil communication. We be You're listening to Prevalent Ministries on the Prevalent Podcast channel. I'm Fred Rochester. Thanks so much for joining with us today. We're going to pray and then get right into today's message. Heavenly Father, we thank you that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished or equipped unto every good work. We thank you, Lord, that you remind us that the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and that no creature is hidden from your sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Lord, we ask that you would open up our understanding and open up our minds that we may comprehend the scriptures. These things we thank you for in Jesus name. Amen. Again, we thank you so much for joining us in our live stream broadcast. And so we're going to get right into the word of God. And today's message is very simple. The company we keep. It's essential that we keep good company, but I also find that there are other things that we do do when we get around people we sort of like act like a chameleon and change our colors when certain people are around us and we're going to see examples in the scriptures of this particular activity that we do so let's go into the bible into the book of uh first corinthians chapter 15 beginning at verse 29 otherwise what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, and he's not talking about animals, he's talking about people. What advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die do not be deceived evil company corrupts good habits awake to righteousness and do not sin for some do not have the knowledge of god i speak this to your shame so what was happening was that uh the believers at corinth were uh discussing doctrine and perhaps in this a particular instance of scripture because the chapter that we're talking about chapter 15 is a very long chapter and so paul was talking about the rising or raising from the dead and it's very important for us to understand that whenever people begin to bring strange doctrine and to bring a counter doctrine which is not a doctrine or a gospel at all it is an attempt to corrupt you. And so we need to understand that uh, false doctrine can corrupt people or even a misleading or a misguiding of the scriptures can corrupt people. And we see this throughout the body of Christ, regardless of the denomination that you may be in, that when people become that, that when people come with their interpretation of scripture and exalt their interpretation above the already interpreted scriptures, it can corrupt good manners. In fact, if you were to read first and second Timothy, you will find that Hymenius, Alexander and Philetus, they were corrupting the believers to the point and to the degree that they were shipwrecking some faith, say, some people's faith, saying that the resurrection had already taken place and that corrupted a whole lot of believers. In other words, they've turned away from the faith as a result. But like I said before, all you have to do is go out to the graveyards to see if anybody was raised from the dead or rise from the dead. If the graves are still covered up and the tombstone is still there and the bodies are still in the in the in the casting or the urn bottle box or whatever you want to call it that they're buried in the ossuary for Jews. And then the resurrection didn't take place. So they were shipwrecked without even checking the graveyard. So you have to be very careful of people that bring in strange doctrine to corrupt good habits or to corrupt 
uh, the very doctrine of Christ that is given to us by Paul and also the uh, apostles of uh, the Lamb. But notice what it says here, do not, be, do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. Evil company corrupts good habits. So when a person is bringing a strange doctrine and you do not hold them to task, in other words, to test them according to what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21, test all things. Hold fast to that which is good, abstain from evil, that's verse 22. Then it's very easy for people to uh, be persuaded or influenced to uh, accept a counter doctrine. And I, and we see this in the book of uh, Galatians when uh, Paul says, I, I see that you, you quickly moved away from the gospel. And, and so... One of the things that we have to understand is that the gospel is the gospel. It's not going to go away. Lies lie, but the truth still stands. And so you have to move away from people that bring in strange doctrine and hold fast to that which is good. So evil company corrupts good habits. So let's uh, look at some definitions in terms of uh, uh, communications. The word evil means is, is the Greek word kakos. I hope I pronounced that correctly. But it means universally of a bad nature and not such as it ought to be. So then we look at the word corrupts and a very simple definition. It means to shrivel or wither, to spoil by any process or generally to ruin. So evil communications corrupts or ruins good habits. The word manners can be defined as worthless, depraved, or injurious. I'm sorry, that's the uh, further definition of the word evil. But the word uh, manners uh, can be also used in terms of, of, of a mode of thinking, uh, feeling, acting, base, wrong, wicked. Uh, manners uh, is, is the Greek word ethos, which is spelled E-T-H-O-S. And it means ethical conduct or moral. So if I confuse the uh, definitions, I'm sorry, I apologize. So I'm going to go back over it just to make sure that you get the uh, the correct definition. So manners is ethics, which means moral habits and in Vine's uh, expository dictionary of words, uh, ethical conduct or morals. So um, when it comes to evil communications, uh, the word communications is the Greek word homo, uh, homologia, which is uh, which is defined as uh, a word. So when you are communicating, you are pulling on people to think, act and be like you. It's an influence upon you and others. If your heart is changed, born again, made right in Christ, then when you interact with each other, nothing but the good nature of Jesus should be heard and shown. The base definition from the Greek uses the word homilia. Hope I spelled that, uh, said that correctly, but if not, I'm sorry. And it means companionship. Companionship by implication, intercourse, communication between individuals. In other words, just like having a normal conversation with an individual. In other words, there is evil or good social interaction between people, and this will influence your behavior or conduct. Here in the book of Proverbs chapter 1, beginning at verse 10, we will see how this evil communication can corrupt individuals. Verse 10 says, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol or the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit, the grave. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. This sounds like Psalm 1, doesn't it? Keep your foot from their path, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, but they lie in wait for their own blood. 
They lurk secretly for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owners. So if there is evil communications that corrupts or ruins good manners, there must be good communication that positively builds, enhances, emanate, which means to give out good behavior. That's why you must guard who and what your influences are in life because whatever and whoever gets into your life, uh, will that will flow out of your life. So you got to be very careful of the influences around your life. I find that sometimes when we're around other individuals, we know who the riffraffs are. We know the certain individuals that are, are godly, you know, in Christ. They, they speak the word of God correctly. But we also know certain friends and family members that do not have a lifestyle in Christ. And if you're not solid in your walk in the Lord, they can easily influence you to walk in the way of evil. And that's why it's very important that you watch who you hang out with, the company that you keep. Because if you keep the wrong company, they will influence you to do evil. Uh, and, and I know that uh, we are hearing about Eric Adams, the, the mayor of New York City, and also certain individuals. We see that there is an investigation by the uh, FBI concerning things that may have taken place several years ago and that has now been brought to light. But you see the inner circle that is caught up in this uh, alleged corruption has it to be proven in court. And so we uh, here in the United States, we do have what is called the presumption of innocence. And so the people are presumed innocent until proven guilty, which means that a prosecutor has to present his or her case before a jury, an uh, independent jury or a, a impartial jury and present the case. And that's why in many of your court proceedings, you will see the judge give the jury instructions on not to watch anything on the news, do anything to get information about the case outside of the courtroom, because only what is presented in the courtroom is to be uh, used by the jury as evidence to either convict or acquit a defendant. So you have to be very careful of the allegations, but nonetheless, we do see that the there is always a circle, <coughs> excuse me, there's always a circle of individuals that influence each other. So that's why you have to be very careful of the company that you keep. So I just wanted to point that out, whether, it, whether the allegations is correct or incorrect or frivolous or for, or or uh, the case is brought up for whatever purpose. That's not my intent. My intent is to show you that uh, in the investigation with Eric Adams, there was a circle of influence that took place. And those individuals that have uh, been charged or will be charged, you will see that that is a circle of influence. So that was my intent about that situation. But nonetheless, we look at Proverbs chapter four and verse 23, it says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it springs the issues of life. In other words, guard your heart. So when you're around individuals, you need to guard your heart. Do we change who we are when we're before people? When sinners walk into our midst, do we hide our light? Or do we expose our light for them to see? Or when we're before one group of believers, do we change who we are when we sit before them or are we consistent? Here's a good example in the book of Galatians chapter two, beginning at verse 11. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I, I withstood him. Paul withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed for bef before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them, before them all, 
if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? For who are Jews for we who excuse me, we who are Jews by nature and we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, which is the uh, gain righteousness by the law. <coughs> Excuse me. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives. But Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith, by live by faith in the in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside or frustrate as the King James Bible said, the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. So what was happening here was that they were uh, sitting in Antioch and then all of a sudden there would be. Uh, certain Judaizers who would come up from Antioch, uh, come up rather from Judea and go into Antioch and try to influence the believers that if you if you are not circumcised according to Moses law, you cannot be saved. This, of course, was false doctrine, which, of course, Paul rightfully shot down because we're not justified by the law. We're justified by faith in Christ Jesus is what Paul was uh, referring to. And so Peter played the hypocrite. Barnabas was persuaded to play the hypocrite and Paul had to confront them to their face and let them know that we're justified by faith, not by the works of the law. So can you see how evil communications corrupt good habits or good manners? Even bad doctrine can corrupt good habits. And this bad doctrine almost persuaded Peter and Barnabas, but Paul had to step in and uh, tell them how the gospel is, is working. And that is that we are justified by faith in Christ alone and not by the works of the law. I'm going to see another example of, of Peter around certain individuals. Now, again, I want to point out that the company that you keep, that's what's most likely going to influence how you behave. And so you have to be steadfast in your conviction in the word of God, irrespective of other people's feelings, other people's uh, uh, ideologies or narratives. You have to stand firm in the faith in terms of the word of God and be able to give the word of God the way that is supposed to be given to them because we stand for the truth here in the book of Matthew chapter 26 and beginning at verse 69. Now, Peter sat outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. Now, when you deny deny it with an oath, you're saying I you, and, and I cringe when I say this because Jesus says, swear not by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, because it is footstool, nor by Jerusalem, because it is the city of the great king. But in order for you to understand where I'm coming from, I will have to say it. I swear I don't know him. No, we don't do that. Because you can't turn one hair white or black, Jesus said. Verse 73, and a little later, those who stood by came, excuse me, came up and said to Peter, surely you also are one of them for your speech betrays you. 
Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. So in order for him, for Peter to get out under the fact that he is the, uh, the an apostle of the Lamb, of the, an, a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, he began to use the language of the world. And so when you use the language of the world, what you're doing is that you're trying to prove to them that you're not a believer, that you're not a Christian, that you're not a child of the living God. And that's what happens when we are influenced by evil communication. We be uh, individuals that have evil or corrupt uh, communications. They will influence you to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I find so often with a whole lot of believers that we really don't want to show our light. We don't want to be salt in the earth because we don't want to send waves that perhaps would bring persecution to our own individual lives. Remember what Jesus said in the book of Mark chapter eight, and he said it very, very uh, clearly that uh, if you desire to follow after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow after me. He also said that he that saves his life will lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake will find it. In other words, you're willing to surrender your life in order to find eternal life in Christ. So when you're around certain individuals, certain believers, you have to remember that we are not supposed to surrender who we are in Christ Jesus for no reason at all. Because we are the salt of the earth and we are the light of the world under Christ because Christ is the light of the world. But Jesus said of us out of the book of Matthew chapter five and verses uh, 13, 14 and 15 that we are the salt of the earth and we are the light of the world. And that means, of course, obviously under Jesus. But you have to begin to show up some somehow. And when the opportunity presents itself, you must not hide who you are. You must reveal who you are because you may be the only preservative that people have. You may be the only light that people will see. So you have to be very careful not to hide because it may bring persecution to you. But notice the scripture goes on to say here about Peter in verse uh, verse uh, 74. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed and Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Now, of course, Peter did recover from this because we saw that in the book of Acts chapter uh, two, that Peter stood up to preach the gospel. And from that point on, from the time in which Jesus was raised from the dead and the Holy Spirit came into the earth and came upon Peter's life, he was stall. He was strong in his faith, but he backtracked a little bit. In fact, if you were to go into the book of Acts chapter 10, you will see that there was a vision that Peter had. The, the vision, the vision came at that a a curtain or a a, a sheet, rather not a curtain, but a sheet came down and it had all sorts of uh, four footed beasts and wild animals and and foul birds, birds that are not acceptable. And the voice said to Peter, "Rise, Peter, slay and eat." And Peter said, "I have not eaten anything uncommon nor unclean." And then the Lord told told him. Do not call what is common unclean. In other words, the Lord Jesus was directly uh, teaching him a lesson that he should have learned out of John chapter 13 and verse 34, that all men will know that you are my disciples when you have love one for another. And so uh, men from Cornelius came, summoned for Peter. Peter preached the word. And as a result, uh, the Cornelius, Cornelius and many of the believers that were, many of the individuals that were there, became, were there became believers. So you have to remember that God will confront us in certain areas of our lives just when things are not going the way that they should. And that reminds me of one particular thing that the circumstances that some of us may be going through, not some, not all, but some 
is a reminder to us all to get back into the scriptures and to get back into prayer and and to line up our lives with the word of God because uh, uh, we can do all of the nice things that is churchy, but when it comes to the obedience of the scriptures, the Lord every now and then sends circumstances in our lives to remind us to tighten our lives. So it's very important that we get back into the scriptures and begin to see that these things are essential because when we're around people, we're supposed to be salt and light to them. Now, are we the same when we're before people? Do they see the same behavior, the same character, the same person? Or do we become a chameleon? Now, what is a chameleon? A chameleon is a slow, a small, slow moving old world lizard with a prehensile tail, long, extensible tongue, protruding eyes that rotate independently and a highly developed ability to change color. In other words, he begins to learn how to blend in with his surroundings. It's partly a defensive mechanism, but it's also a way to attract its prey. What the word chameleon actually means is that he's a ground lion, a lion of the ground, if you will. So uh, what is a chameleon in, uh, in human terms? A person who changes their opinions or behavior according to the situation. In other words, you adjust who you are to either become acceptable or to be uh, brought in and accepted by the crowd. And that's why we should never be chameleons before people. We're one or the other. We're either salt or light, or we are rocks and darkness. Now, again, uh, uh, in the natural person that is a chameleon is a person who changes their opinions or behavior according to the situation. Now, remember Job's three friends and Elihu, the fourth friend. A lot of us and I myself included have put uh, have talked about this story on numerous occasions. And I always talk about the three friends, but we never got to the fourth friend. Have you ever noticed? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever read the entire book of Job or at the very least good, good portions of the book of Job? A lot of us uh, stop at chapter three, maybe even go beyond that, go chapter four, chapter five, or find certain parts in the book of Job to use as uh, illustrations to teach certain principles, uh, you know, revelatory teaching and all that, which is really unfounded. Uh, uh, But we never got to the reason why Job went through what he went through. Now, it's interesting to point out that Job did not curse God at any time nor said anything wrong about what he was going through as far as what God was allowing. But there was something in Job's heart that God was after. If you were to go into the book of uh, Job chapter 32, you will begin to see that Elihu was the fourth friend of Job. And out of the bunch, he was the youngest. So there was such a thing as seniority. So he allowed the older individuals to speak and he and Elihu sat there and kept his mouth shut the whole time. And I could just imagine Elihu getting, you know, upset about what these three witnesses, uh, three friends of Job's Job were saying. And they were trying to accuse Job of sin and make that the reason why Job went through what he did. But what did it do? It got Job mad to the point where he began to be self-righteous and began to pontificate, if you will, and to show these three friends that I am righteous and that I have established self-righteousness. And that was the thing that God was after. So it took Elihu to reveal to Job that he was self-righteous. After Elihu had spoken, The Lord appeared in a whirlwind and the only thing that Job can do was to stand there and say, I repent. What is it that Job repented of? His self-righteousness. And you see, that's why certain circumstances 
are given to us in certain areas of our life, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes to reveal certain things in our lives that we would not have paid attention to. Now, many of you might say, well, why didn't God just tell Job that you're self-righteous? No, God chose to put Job through a situation where it finally got through to him that he was self-righteous. It probably would not have done that much of a good if God would have told him straight up. So uh, we can't be upset at God for bringing us through situations in our lives just to identify something that may need correction in our lives. And we must never, never be upset at the chastening of the Lord because that's part of the growth in Christ process that we all go through as believers. And so you have to be very careful not to despise the chastening of the Lord or to despise the circumstances that we all go through. Of course, we don't want to go through them. Nobody does. But we do go through these things, and it's in order to teach us certain lessons that we need to uh, underscore in our lives so that way we can be the child of God that is a part of being a born-again believer. So Job was self-righteous, and it took circumstances to uncover his self-righteousness. Uh, Why couldn't God just tell Job? Because God uses things to get our attention, and then the three friends accused Job of gross sin, which further entrenched Job in his self-righteousness. So we have to be very careful not to uh, despise the chastening of the Lord and to accuse God of certain things and not go off the handle with God about certain things happening in our life. It is for the purpose of revealing something to us. Now, it's not with all circumstances. We all know that the enemy does attack certain things in our lives, and, and we get that. And, and the only remedy with that is the grace of God. Remember what Paul said, that God said to Paul, that my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And then he said, much gladly, therefore, I go through these infirmities. And so you have to understand that there is a there is a place and a, and a time for these uh, things to occur in our lives. And it's for the purpose of instructing and teaching us. Well, why can't we just be taught or be instructed by the word? Because sometimes we just don't get it. I mean, we're not that far uh, gone in our growth in the Lord that we we finally get everything. Sometimes the Lord used illustrations to teach us. And so we have to be ready for these illustrations that do come in life because the Lord is teaching us something through them. Now, back into the scriptures here in the book of uh, Hebrews, chapter 13, uh, Jesus Christ and verse eight, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. Now, the reason why I point this scripture out is so that way you can see that just as the Lord is the same, we must remain the same around people. We must not be a chameleon. We must not be that kind of individual that changes up every time somebody walks in. And then as soon as they walk out, another group walk, walks in and then we change color on them. And then as soon as they walk out, another group comes in and then we change color or we walk around to certain people and we change with the group. Each, dip, each group we have a color for as a chameleon each group we have a color for so why is that it's because we don't want to want for people to see who we're supposed to be in Christ Jesus and that and that's why evil communications corrupt good habits we have to stay away from evil people and be the same just as Jesus is the same here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and, and verse 11, we will see, this is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he, will al he also will deny us. If we are faithful, if we are faithless rather, he remains faithful. Faithful, He cannot deny himself. And so the Lord is not going to change on you. He's not going to be a chameleon on you. He is not going to, when you're feeling or acting a certain way, he's not going to come and, and appear any different. He is going to be the same. So it is to be the same for us that regardless of the group of people that we're around, 
we need to remain the same. Because when we remain the same, we're doing what the Lord Jesus is doing. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So tomorrow, you be the same. Tomorrow you be the same. You don't be someone different or something different. Now I know like like I know that we like wearing different outfits, different hairdos, different makeup, and things of that nature. And we want to show difference and 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 so forth. And we want to be uh, uh we want to have a change of identity. But you see, we have only one identity, and that is Christ Jesus. And so before people, we are to remain the same, just as He remains the same here in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 10 beginning at verse 32 therefore whoever confesses me before men him I will also confess before my father who is in heaven but he but whoever denies me before men him I will also deny before my father who is in heaven. Now, I know that there's a lot of word about we need to unify as a body of Christ. We need to come together, and there's nothing wrong with that. But we are to come to the unity of the faith, as Paul said in the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 4. It's the unity of the faith. What, what is the faith? Unity of the faith in Christ alone. And so there's going to be differences of opinions within the body of Christ. Not everybody has faith, Paul says. And so we have to understand that people will not gravitate to the solid meat of the word of God. You will have certain individuals in various places of growth. That's the 30, 60 and 100 fold that we see in the book of Luke chapter eight, as far as the, uh, the, the parable of the sower is concerned. But when it comes to being in Christ, we are to remain the same at all times. And even with the different groups that we may come around or the different groups that we may go to, we are to remain the same. And if they change their minds and their attitudes is for the purpose of influencing you to change your mind and your attitude. But you refuse to do that because if you deny Christ, Christ will deny you before the the father and the angels in heaven. So you have to be very, very careful to remain the same, regardless of the people that are around you. Jesus said, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword for I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. <coughs> Excuse me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake. And he who loses his life for my sake. Will find it. And so that's what we want to present to you because we want you to be solid in your relationship with Christ. I find that one of the reasons why people do not witness to sinners is because you're ashamed of him. Paul said this in the book of Romans chapter one and verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation. So don't be ashamed of who you are in Christ Jesus and don't hide your light and don't stop being salt because that may be you may be the only preservative and light that they will ever know. So do not deny or be ashamed of who you are in Christ to the world. Here in the book of Matthew chapter 5 and beginning of verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but the salt loses its flavor. How shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the household. Verse 16. 
Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Your righteous living is a strong influence on the world. And finally, here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 12, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I did not find Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I departed from Macedonia. Now thanks be to God who always leads us to try in triumph in Christ. Excuse me. And through us diffuses or releases the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the, the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So when we come around people, don't be influenced by people. Hold fast to the faith and stay true to the scriptures. Don't fall for their ways of influence to try to get you not to talk about Christ or not to talk about the scriptures. Don't fall for it. Always present the scriptures. Some of you know by now that when I hear certain things, I'm going to bring a scripture that perhaps will help you to uh, uh, see the, the, the word in, in, in the way that we're supposed to. And, and that's the intent. And, and, and so we bring the word to bear. That's our job. And so don't, don't get upset when we're always bringing scripture to bear on certain things because that's what we do. We want you to be solid in your relationship with the Lord. So when we come among people to the world, we are a fragrance of death. So Paul goes on to say, just reading verse 15 again, for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life and who is sufficient for these things. For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, hucksters, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. So evil communications corrupt good, uh, good habits. And if you have established good habits in terms of your growth in Christ, you are to maintain those good habits and not be persuaded or influenced to be otherwise. And that's why some people grow in Christ and others don't because, first of all, they're afraid of the persecution coming from their friends. But you can't be a chameleon, especially in the body of Christ. You can't change your colors because you want to be one thing to one people and another thing to other people. And you can't do that. That's not being sincere or truthful or honest. As Paul pointed out in the book of Galatians chapter two, Paul called Barnabas and Peter hypocrites. And that's one thing that we don't want to do. Perhaps you're listening today and you do not have a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible is very clear in Romans chapter three and verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But verse 24 says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. What sins are we talking about? How many lies have you said in your life? How many items have you stolen irrespective of its value? How many times have you used the name of the Lord in vain? How many times have you looked upon a man or a woman with lust? Jesus said, if you look upon a woman with lust in the book of Matthew chapter five, you have committed adultery with her already in your heart. We're talking about those sins and perhaps others. But thank God that the Lord Jesus Christ was sent to pay for our sins. When he died on the cross, he said it is finished, meaning paid in full. Meaning that the debt of sin was paid in full. What you need to do is repent. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Bible says uh, in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, and verse uh, 17. 
Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The word repent means to turn from sin, not just to be sorry, even though the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10, for godly sorrow works repentance leading to salvation, but that's not enough. You now have to place faith on Christ alone. To do that, you need to repent of sin first of all, and then place faith on Christ alone. You need to do it today because at the close of business, 150,000 people will have perished from both the face of the earth. You and I may be one of them. And if we're not saved, if we're not born again, because Jesus said in John chapter three and verse three, you accept a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He cannot see the kingdom of God. You must be born again. So we admonish you today that you repent of sin because God commands men everywhere to repent and to place faith on Christ alone. We thank you so much for joining us here on our live broadcast. And until next time, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You've been listening to Prevailing Word Ministries on the Prevailing Word Podcast channel. We're on YouTube, YouTube Podcast, and Patreon. Please visit our website at prevailingwithministries.net. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm Fred Rochester. Thanks for listening.